Behavioral Health Today, a podcast by Tried Behavioral Health, covering trending topics in behavioral and mental health. This podcast is designed to share unique and relevant topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor, and I'm joined today by Dr. Aaron Elmore, a psychologist whose San Diego-based practice focuses on children, teens, and young adults. She's also a test prep expert in the broader triad family. Erin, it's really nice to have you here today. Welcome to our show. Thanks, I'm happy to be here. Nice to have you. You know, today we're talking about anxiety and uh, really working to develop a good understanding of it. And some of the things and some of the routines that we can put into place to help us reduce and manage our stress in a life that's oftentimes filled with a good amount of stressors. You know, as we come into this uh, talk today, just kind of setting a framework around it. We know that anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the United States, affecting about 18% of the adult population every year. The good news around anxiety disorders is that they are highly treatable, yet only about 37% of the people suffering from anxiety really receive treatment. So I'm really excited about today's show to get the word out there to both understand what anxiety is, ways that we can come to put it into a proper perspective and some ways that we can treat it. So as we start off today, lay out for us kind of a, kind of a definition of what anxiety is so we get a grasp of it and also maybe some of the role of our autonomic nervous system in anxiety being experienced. Yeah, so I, th- I think it's good to distinguish between kind of basic anxiety or what we might call stress versus clinical anxiety. So I'll explain a little bit of the difference between the two, but you know, basically we can all relate to anxiety on some level, on some spectrum. So it's one, it's a common emotion that originally helps for our survival. So if you think back in the caveman days, like the lion runs up, of course we need to feel some stress to run away and save ourselves. And so, you know, the idea is anxiety or fear or stress actually isn't always bad. It tells us there's danger. It tells us we need to do something. Um, so it can be a good thing, but you know, that, it's the feeling of when your heart pounds or your mind starts racing. You know, anything like that can be a sign that stress is, is coming. Stress is really something that we think of more of as coming from an external source. So a circumstance or situation that is difficult, is stressful. But when you're talking about true clinical anxiety, the, the source is also internal. And that's mm-hmm. where you get a lot more discomfort and difficulty on a daily basis. So that's where we can talk about the sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous system, like what's happening at a biological level. So you may have heard of these as the, the sympathetic nervous system is the fight, flight, or freeze in action. And that's when you know some, some danger is present and we need to take some action. So automatically, some people fight, some people freeze, some people run away or flight. Um, and we don't have too much control over what your initial reaction is, but that's a sign that there's some danger. And in today's world, obviously that's not lions running out in the middle of nowhere. It's more of like work stress or COVID or family sure. stressors or financial stress. It's more of this chronic type of stress, which is why I think a lot of people are experiencing more anxiety in our culture today. And, and, but what happens when your system is activated like that is your stress hormones go up, cortisol is your stress hormone. If that stays up too long, you can have some serious mental and physical struggles and, and symptoms. You can have you know, heart racing, aches, pains, somatic symptoms, like just general pains. Obviously, this palm sweating, racing thoughts, worrying. It's just not a good state to stay in for too long. If it stays active too long, there's studies that show we have lowered immunity, heightened stress overall. We can't even absorb the nutrients in our meal as well if we're eating when we're in a state of fight, flight, or freeze. It affects our sleep. So all in all, in a short burst, this is okay. It can be helpful, but chronically, this could be really difficult. So the goal is to move into parasympathetic nervous system, which is the opposite. And we call that the rest and digest and that's where you're more calm, you're not in a state of heightened stress, and obviously that's much better for your nervous system and your mental health. Yeah. I really like that idea that, you know, we need stress in our lives. If we don't have stress, then it, it, it affects a number of things. In fact, if we don't have stress, we die. So we need a certain amount. Yerkes Dodson came up with a uh, bell-shaped curve, the bell-shaped curve of arousal, stress arousal. And on the front end, if you're not stressed enough, then you're not getting things done. You're uh, underperforming. 
if you're on the downside of the bell-shaped curve, then you're just kind of crispy and burnt and you're not functioning at your highest performance. And the idea is to stay at the top of the bell-shaped curve, almost like at 11 or one o'clock, if you will, at the very top. And that's when we have our, our kind of athletes call it being in the zone or people that are, you know, really just performing very, very well are typically at that place. So there's a place for stress. Yes. And we can actually enhance our performance and really help us be really keen in the things that we're doing. But when it begins to become chronic and begins to kind of go down that bell-shaped curve or our, our autonomic nervous system begins to kind of manage things in a stressful way over time, that fight, flight, freeze, fade, those, those kinds of things really become costly, don't they? But I love the idea that we can respond to stress in really manageable ways. When we talk about stress, who are some of the folks that we see typically being at risk for stress? COVID is one of the things you're talking about being a part of our lives right now, or mm -hmm. traumas and other things. What do you see being some of the stressful events that we can make people aware of that if they're not dealing with, they can become stressful to the point of anxiety, et cetera? Yeah, I think it could be something as obvious as like natural disasters or like you mentioned COVID right now. That's a chronic ongoing fear that if you leave your home, you could actually be exposed to, to a deathly illness. But it also could be pretty much any transition or any kind of stressful event. Even a positive stress can sometimes turn into anxiety because we get a burst of adrenaline with a positive event, you know, like a, a wedding or a party or, you know, some, some positive celebration. And so if you're exposed to too many stressful events in a short period of time, whether that's good stress or bad stress, it could tip your system into more of that, that heightened adrenaline. But often we see this mostly people who've undergone some kind of trauma, especially childhood trauma. You're at a much higher risk of having anxiety as an adult. And, and you know, I think that makes sense if you're exposed to a, a situation where you need to be in fight, flight, or freeze to survive for a while, then your body learns that that's the normal way to be, which is actually helpful during that time. But once that's you're okay. safe, it can backfire and you need to kind of unlearn that way of being. I really like that. I look at anxiety and you mentioned it before that anxiety, the, the, the definition I use with those that I work with is the perception of a threat and the perception that I can't manage that threat. And the key word in there is perception. It's what we assign both to what the threat actually is and our ability to manage that threat. At its very best, stress is really like a, an early indicator to us, isn't it? That something is going on, something's stirring me up, mm -hmm. and maybe I might want to pay attention to it. It's really hard, though, when someone becomes anxious and they go into a panic attack, and panic attacks are awful. Some of the things you mentioned, just the, the, the awful feeling in a panic attack, and maybe you could talk about those symptoms in just a second, but when we're in it, it feels like you're either going to go crazy or you're going to die yeah. because you don't know what they are yet. But it's our body's best attempt to try and say, hey, there's something here that I want you to pay attention to, and I'm actually befriending you in this moment, making you feel awful. So you get to take a look at what it is that's in front of you that you may not be recognizing as something that I want you to deal with. And so if we have that perception of a threat, the perception I can't deal with it, maybe there's something in that that we get to look at and say, what is it that's actually stressful to me that I might need to even address? In fact, I had somebody come into my office this week, someone who I'd seen years ago came back in and, and highly, highly anxious. And she was sharing with me that she was going back to school and, and she wanted to find ways just to kind of calm down some of her anxieties and kind of manage some of the stressors coming up. And as I probed with her a little bit more, I recognized and learned that her work environment was actually a very stressful, actually abusive place for her to be, mm. where she didn't feel protected, safe. She felt vulnerable. She felt like she was very alone, at risk. And so in this case, like you're suggesting earlier, that's the saber tooth tiger, if you will, coming at us back in the day. But it's our stressors nowadays where someone is believing that they have to deal with these stressors or they get so used to dealing with these stressors that they just kind of minimize them or they talk themselves into, well, this is just normal, right? Until their body is saying, no, it's not. I want you to pay attention to this. I want you to address this. And I need you to do something about it because your system is working too hard to manage the stress right now. And I want you to act on it. So actually stress can actually be something that's our our, our, our friend or something in our favor to really alert us to some things that we need to be paying attention to that we may not be paying attention to. Yeah, I love that frame. It's like, it's really our ally. And although it can our seem ally. really scary, and it is scary if you're having a panic attack, you know, 
but really it is pointing out something's not working, something hasn't been working for a while and it's time to learn new ways to deal. And I usually remind my clients that that's actually progress because again, it's not like you have it when you're younger for no reason. It's like you needed it for a while. You needed to be in that state of, of anxiety to survive. But if your body is saying, hey, this isn't working anymore, that actually indicates that you're ready to let it go and try new ways of dealing with it, which is really, really good. You know, our bodies have and our, and our beings have such the ability for adaptation and we can adapt to things just in phenomenal ways. And we also have the ability to habituate, you know, some of the things that we experience. So they become kind of our normal. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we grew up in a family where this was just our normal. We don't know what we don't know about what anxiety really may be and really how it's not healthy for us. When we talk about anxiety symptoms, even panic symptoms, what are some of the presenting some signs and symptoms that you see that you get to say, hey, just so you know, this is what anxiety looks like. And this is not normal. In fact, we probably want to try and bring in, like you said earlier, that parasympathetic nervous system to bring a sense of calm. But what are some of the signs and symptoms that you see people presenting with, with anxiety and with panic? Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's mental symptoms. So people talk about how they can't sleep at night because their mind just goes, 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 or they can't focus because they're really just thinking of too many things on the back burner. Chronic worry, like not, not just worried about one instance, but maybe just like literally the worst case scenario for almost every situation in your life. And that can be exhausting. So being tired and fatigued is also a symptom. And then there's a bunch of physical symptoms as well. Like you know, some people have sweaty palms, some people stutter, some people literally feel like they're going to die. As you mentioned, that gets more into the panic attack level where some people are vomiting, some people lose bowel control um, in the middle of nowhere. So it's very scary to think that, that that could happen to you and very embarrassing, obviously. And then the fear of being afraid becomes a problem. And that's when you actually have a panic disorder you're worried about having a panic attack in an uncontrollable yeah, awesome. way. It's awful, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I refer to that as the fear of the fear, this idea that when you don't understand what it is, you become really afraid that you have no control over what's going on. You're not recognizing quite yet that these symptoms coming up are actually indicating to you, almost like a circuit breaker in a house, and there's too much stress on the system. In fact, Selye, who came up with the word stress, my understanding is that in hindsight, he wishes that he had uh, renamed stress with strain. Oh, it's more of an engineering term. And the way that they understand the strength of a beam is the weight they put on the beam until it buckles. And that's the strain that they measure. So he kind of wishes he'd use the word strain to measure, like you said earlier, just how much stress is being put on the system. But folks don't recognize that they're, because of the adaptation and habituation, how much stress they're really taking on. And we can expand a hold quite a bit. And maybe in our families, like I said earlier, this is just a normal thing. But they, like you said, all these symptoms, heart racing and feeling lightheaded, needing to lay down, all of these things feel scary. And then, like you said, that fear of the fear kicks in like, oh no, when's the next one gonna happen? Like I've got no control over it. I'm at its mercy, really. And so their lives become very small, don't they? In fact, yes. they, 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 they be, and lives become very narrow. Have you noticed that too? Absolutely. It's just, yeah, it's so scary to think that you could be out of control in a social situation yes. like that. You know, it's, it's embarrassing, but also even just within your own self, even if you're by yourself, it's terrifying. And so there's that desire. It, it seems like control is the antidote of anxiety. We like to think that if we had more control, then the anxiety wouldn't happen. Yeah. And so people are looking for ways to control their environment. And usually you're right, their world becomes smaller and the fear just grows and grows and grows. And there's another I guess another perspective to think about about how these two things show up that I was thinking about as you were speaking. And it's, I see some people are over functioners who are anxious and some people are under functioners. And so I think sometimes we tend to think, Oh, I'm not having those symptoms. I'm totally fine. I'm pushing through. I'm not anxious at all. But in fact, some people who are very driven, very type A, get very high achieving, they may suffer from anxiety as well. It could be they're just trying to stay in control by ignoring it, by pushing it down, by pushing through. And then you have other people who are so overcome by the fear that they stop, not, not that they stop functioning, but they slow down functioning, they under function, and it looks more like avoidance or laziness even. They may have more of a depressive flair, but really they're terrified, they're anxious. And so it, it really can show up in different ways depending on your personality, I think, and how you respond to that strain. Yeah, with that first group, you're talking about those that kind of push through. It's almost like a manic defense, isn't it? We're pushing through trying to outrun what that, what that anxiety is. We don't have to stop and feel it. 
Yeah. But man, the chemicals we're burning and the, the effort we're putting into it so as not to have to feel. A lot of with anxiety is I don't want to feel it. So I'm, I'm doing like one of those two things you just said. I'm either overperforming or I'm procrastinating, avoiding, distancing, denial, denying, and not functioning at my very best, all in an effort, in our very best way that we know, to avoid having to feel and stop. Those things are going to cause an awful set of feelings. So you're talking about a really, this is a great segue here that you're raising for us, is the goal is to increase control. And in fact, there are ways that we can, one, recognize this, like we're talking about right now, which is essential. We've got to set a framework around what anxiety is and what it's not. What it's not is something that we need to be afraid of, avoid, outrun, outwork, whatever it may be. When we, the, the more we do that, it's almost like the boogeyman in the closet. The more you don't look, the bigger it becomes. But if we can kind of lean into it and understand what it is, people begin to go, oh, so this is my ally. This is something that I can recognize some early signs and symptoms of and actually recognize at an earlier level, earlier level rather than waiting to get you know, to like a 10 out of one out of 10. I can catch it early and recognize there's something here that I need to deal with, which I think is brilliant. So you're talking about control and our goal is really to increase that. Let's talk about some of the ways that we can do that, even including activating the parasympathetic nervous system in the process. Yeah, well, thankfully, there's a lot of good research that we actually can fight anxiety. We can befriend it. Actually, it's probably a better way to think of it instead of fighting it <laughs> and, and listen to what it's telling us. And, and the goal is not to get rid of it because, again, we need it. It's a good thing. But the goal is to be able to hear it without feeling like it's going to completely drown us and to still be in control in the sense that when we feel it, uh, even if we feel it at times, we would not like to. So we're not going to feel control over when it shows up all the time. But at least when we do feel it, we have some tools and some ability to get the voice to be a little smaller. And then in that sense, we can gain control again and have a, a wider life, you know. But the key from research is what works is it has to be consistent. What you're doing has to be intentional. It doesn't happen overnight. Really, you're sort of rewiring your brain and reactivating that parasympathetic nervous system. So that takes time, kind of like working out. You know, it's not, you're not going to have awesome arms after one arm day at the gym. You have to do it consistently and it's going to hurt and you're going to have days where you're sore. But if you do it consistently, you can see change. And sometimes I think they've even said you can see change as early as a couple of weeks. Um, so you can, you can see that this is working for you and it'll give encouragement to keep going. But so some of the things that we know, and feel free to chime in, Graham, because I know you know a lot about this as well, but I think deep breathing, or some people also refer to meditation, which is similar, but a little different because those exercises actually directly speak to the parasympathetic yes. nervous system. They kind of bypass the mind, which can overthink or underthink things. So that's really helpful because you can be in a immediate stressful situation and do some deep breathing and feel an automatic calming down. Or it can also be something that you do as a routine, which is, is more recommended to do a few minutes each day. And then over time, you're going to see huge gains from that. So one breath work that I really like is called the four, seven, eight breath. And Graham, you're smiling. I can tell you've heard of this one. It's, yeah, they've done research on it and it directly goes to your vagus nerve, which is, which again, communicates to your parasympathetic nervous system. So you would breathe in for four counts and, and really deep breath for four counts and fill your lungs. And then you hold your breath for seven counts and then breathe out through your mouth for eight counts. And I usually do this two or three times in a row um, and you can immediately feel a letdown. Some people even feel a little dizzy afterward, but like a yeah, good kind exactly. of dizzy. Yeah. So that can be really grounding and nobody has to see you do this. It's just really something simple you can do quickly. So there's also so many apps and resources out there online. If you're interested in exploring meditation, you know, this doesn't have to be like a, a spiritual thing. It's more of a being present in the moment and teaching your mind to calm down, which is yes. really, really, really helpful. So there's calm app, there's a breathe app, but it's spelled with two E's. There's so many options that people can look into and they help you learn how to meditate, but really it's just being present. So, you know, you really could be like sitting that. outside, you know, just listening yeah. to the birds and that's, that's still mindfulness as well. When you think about when we get anxious, what do we do? We start to uh, kind of what we call shoulder breathe. It's a very, it's almost a, uh, it's a very shallow breath and it actually can increase our anxiety. And when we're in an anxious place, all the blood's going to the wrong places. It's not, it's not, it's not going where our, our, our blood vessels are constricting, uh, our, 
our sight's becoming very myopic and we're, we're, we're looking for something that's a threat. We're becoming very vigilant and it's an awful state to be in. But when we begin to breathe, simply by bringing in the parasympathetic nervous system, I always like the parasympathetic. It's almost like paramedic. Paramedics do what? They help us heal. Mm, love that. So when we're in this anxious state, we can bring in the paramedic simply by breathing in our nose, out our mouth, Typically, you know, in our nose and then when we exhale, the exhale is always twice as long as the inhale. Mm -hmm. What we're going back to is what you said earlier, Aaron, is about, it's about reinstilling control of just simply our breathing and watching what happens. When we breathe in that manner, and I love the 487, I'll do some breathing with folks and I'll actually do it in the office. I will breathe out loud with them so they can hear it. I'll accentuate it so they can hear it. We practice and I love the idea of this diaphragmatic breathing or this tummy breathing where we can actually put our hands on our tummies and feel our belly kind of go out as we breathe. And what happens, I wish, you know, if you hooked us up to biofeedback, we would see that our skin would become warmer. Mm -hmm. Why? Because our, our blood vessels begin to dilate. They begin to come and come closer. And so we have this really rich oxygenated blood going through our system. Like you said, that's kind of where we get a little lightheaded. Our heart rate comes down, our blood pressure comes down, our brain waves line up better, our sight begins to become more acute, you know, around us in, in more expanded ways. All of these things, just like you said, simply from breathing. And that 487 is about, or 478 rather, is about bringing in control. And the, the meditation piece, like you said, is learning to become mindful. Mm -hmm. And that mindfulness is everything, isn't it? In getting a start and bringing this back down to a place of control. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you have kids, some ways you can teach your kids to do this too. It's kind of funny. Let yeah. have them lay flat on their back on a, on the couch or on the ground and you can put like a stuffed animal on their belly. And if the lungs of the stuffed oh, animal like goes that. up and down, then they're belly breathing. Right. And so like you can yeah. teach them how it feels, or even you could do that yourself if you're not sure how it feels, <laughs> just see if your belly is actually going up. That's, that's how it's supposed to feel. Or, you know, like a fun visual is think of a balloon. So you could tell your kids to think, pretend you're a balloon and you're like filling up completely. And then all the air kind of rushes out at the end. It slowly is better, but you know, there's, there's fun ways to teach kids to do that as well, because you know, it's, it's never too early to learn and to build that into our routines. There's no better state to be doing life from. If you're an athlete, you're taking a couple of breaths before you shoot a free throw or, or, or putt a, a, you know, a golf ball or serve a tennis, you know, tennis ball. Athletes do it all the time, all the time. Or those that are doing tests, I recommend they take a diaphragmatic breath before each and every question that they go through. Mm -hmm. uh, or the, uh, I even, and, and you're talking about practicing, I encourage people you know those little red, you know, those, those little dots you put on files, you know, a lot of times. Yeah, yeah, little stickers. I, I encourage people, yeah, I encourage people to get those little small dots. They're pretty inconspicuous. And I tell them to put them like on their rear view mirror, on their speedometer, on their phone, on their toothbrush, to get in the habit of breathing. Every time they see that dot, they just do a, a quick diaphragmatic breath in their nose, out their mouth. To get in the practice of what it's feeling like, like you said earlier, that mindfulness, what it feels like to be in a relaxed state so that when you're not in a relaxed state, you're more mindful of it early so you can intervene early before it gets out of control again. So all of these little things, like you're saying, can come into our lives in such useful ways. So really good. Now, I know there's other things, too, like with our exercise, the benefit of that, our eating habits, sleep, even some of our tech use. You and I have talked about that before. So kind of just really quickly, weave in exercise, eating, sleep. Yeah. So I think, you know, the physical things that we know are so healthy for us, exercise, eating, sleep, those are so, so key for regulating anxiety because sleep, eating, exercise all directly influences our hormones, right? And we know there's a stress hormone, cortisol, and that's what's yes. up when, when we're activated in a negative way with anxiety. So, you know, I, I've seen with clients, if they can just get better sleep, like if we just work on sleep for even a couple weeks, their mood drastically improves. We have more wiggle room to work with coping skills with their anxiety. Same thing for some people for eating. There's actually studies that show that gluten and sugar can really drive up anxiety and also depression. Some people more than others. Some people are more sensitive to it than others. So, you know, just eating healthy, keeping good exercise, all of, and sleeping well is going to keep the, the hormone balance that we need in our bodies and our minds to be able to tackle anxiety. Really so that's good. just huge, huge. Yeah. Yeah. How about things just simply like maybe our mindset? I know gratitude. I know our mindset around some of the pro-social behaviors of just being connected with one another. Even self-compassion can be ways mm -hmm. to mentally and cognitively help us be in a good state as well. Talk about yeah. those as well. I think those kind of get at the, the mental symptoms of anxiety we talked about earlier. So 
Um, studies have found that just the act of trying to think of something that you're appreciative for or grateful for actually rewires your brain to be more positive and less anxious. So don't feel like you have to come up with like these wonderful, big, gregarious reasons why you're grateful. But, you know, people who have some kind of gratitude practice, whether it's a journal or just when they brush their teeth in the morning, they think of three things they're grateful for. Doing that is huge, huge, huge to help for anxiety because um, it, it does just teach you to look for things that are present moment and also positive and anxiety is all about the future and negative so it's like an antidote to the thoughts that you would yeah. have with anxiety and that kind of ties into to being connected to other people so you know the, the what ifs and the fears of the world keep us disconnected even if we're with people we're kind of in our own heads but definitely over time it can keep us more isolated from people and so pro-social behaviors, like actually reaching out to your friends, to your family, checking in on people, you know, helping people, doing some kind of altruistic acts, even t tying it into the electronics, like maybe instead of just scanning social media as a quick anxiety coping mechanism, maybe you take that as a cue that you need connection and actually text somebody instead or call somebody instead. But that, that kind of grounding and connectedness with others has been shown to, to help with anxiety as well. That's really good. I like the timing too. You're suggesting of, of uh, what if we start off our day? And I like to hear just, just, just in a brief kind of nutshell here. There's a, there's a, some studies they've done on the on the cortisol awakening response. They call it CAR CAR, mm -hmm. and that's when our cortisol for those that are anxious is most high. The, the 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 cortisol hormone is 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 the highest in the morning for those that are anxious. So you're talking about what if we start our day kind of putting the, the best cornerstone in place for the rest of our day to be built upon. Talk about that early morning routine. Yeah, and you're right, anxiety is supposed to, or cortisol really is supposed to be highest in the morning to get you up, get you going, and then taper off throughout the day. But for people who have clinical anxiety, it's either all over the map and flipped backwards, or when it's up in the morning, and I'm using air quotes, it's like way up, like way too yes. up. So, you know, here's an example of a routine that you could integrate all these things we're talking about into. But again, the, the key is really just being consistent with yourself and whatever works. But, you know, maybe you wake up and pairing a habit with a habit you already have is the best way to get it going. So that's why I use the example of like, while you're brushing your teeth, think of three things that you're grateful for. So you're already combating that high cortisol. Maybe you have a good workout, and which also combats cortisol. And then obviously make sure you're getting good a good breakfast, a good meal. And then throughout the day, you can do the quick check-ins with yourself as you feel your stress rise, you feel that adrenaline to kick in and do maybe the breathing. Maybe you do the four, seven, eight breathing throughout the day to bring your cortisol down a little bit. And then the evening, you have kind of a cool off where maybe you journal about the day or you do like five minutes of a meditation app, or maybe you go to dinner with friends or connect with your partner. And those are all ways to kind of close out the day and definitely don't be on your phone an hour before bed because that's going to spike everything back up out of whack. You know, so you, you can you can pick and choose which of these techniques you want to try. But the idea is it's it's little, it's simple, quick, easy things throughout the day that could really help you feel like you're in control again and in charge again. It's really good. You mentioned earlier as people are starting to kind of become aware of this and becoming more mindful. You talked about a couple of apps. I, I know there's a couple as well that really stood out to me. One is Happify. They ask a series of questions in this one and it kind of helps track your, your, your thoughts and helping you kind of conquer some negative thoughts and help you find ways to cope with stress. There's another one called Pacifica and it's actually Apple. It was one of Apple's best mental health apps in 2017 and they offer uh, ways to track your mood and your health and habits. Basically, again, like you said earlier, raising mindfulness. Uh, there's also a, an app called Worry Watch. Uh, these are five easy steps that allow you to record and reflect and reason and realize and then refute, helping you look at your cognitive uh, thoughts. Like we said actually earlier, it's kind of the perception of a threat and the perception that I can't handle it. So this app helps you challenge some of these thought patterns to increase control uh, really at that level. So uh, there's, there's some good things out there, aren't there, that we can really weave into uh, yes, our days. Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's good to mention, like, you know, we're talking about basic anxiety or maybe even low level clinical anxiety. But, you know, if you feel like your anxiety is really unbearable or you like you don't even have the energy to try the things we're talking about, or if there's yeah. a flavor of despair in there as well, like suicidal thoughts, self-pity, if you feel like this is just bigger than what we're talking about, absolutely, please seek out some therapeutic help because there are other ways to tackle this at a, at a deeper level. So just be aware that, you know, these things can be helpful, 
very, very helpful, but sometimes you need a little extra support or someone to dig a little deeper with you into the root of where this is coming from. That's really good. I love going down to that root place. It, it does allow us to understand it's there for a reason. Well, I know we're kind of winding down for today, but Aaron, thank you so much for joining our show today. I love the idea that we get to recognize that anxiety in our lives is a normal thing. It's not a bad mm -hmm. thing, but if we can kind of keep it in a manageable place, we can actually enhance our performance. But it, when, when it becomes too much so, that it becomes interfering and costly, isn't it? And you've given us kind of a nice idea of just kind of what it is, how we can embrace it, look at it as an ally, understand that there's actually a physiological reaction to it. But there's some real practical ways that we can come at it to kind of harness it, to maybe even protect ourselves at times or enhance our performance at other times, and uh, some real practical ways that we can come at this to really manage it in ways that are going to be beneficial to our lives. So thank you so much. You are so us. welcome. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. And for those listening, thanks so much for being a part of our podcast. And we look forward to having you join us next time on Behavior Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community. And if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tried Behavioral Health Network, all rights reserved.